Okay, hello everybody. I, uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce um, Eric, Eric Jarvis to you today. Eric is a professor at the Rockefeller University and also the head of the Lab for Neurogenetics of Language, as well as the chair of, a vertebrate, of the Vertebrate Genomes Lab. That is basically a consortium that has been delivering high quality genomes to the community that is very important for, the under, for evolutionary understandings on, from the, with molecular underpinnings. Now, the main interest of Erich is actually to understand the molecular underpinnings of vocal learning and spoken language using mainly birds as model systems. This int uh, his interest in this uh, was triggered and arose probably really early, already during his PhD, which he did in the lab of Fernando Nottebohm, a lab that has been paving the way for the use of songbirds as model systems, not just for vocal learning, but also brain plasticity. And um, so in this lab, Erich actually pioneered the use of molecular tools, gene expression, in the interconnection with behavior. And he was among the first to show that actually the gene expression of immediate early genes and changes of this are correlated with behavior changes as well as behavior purposes. Such as, for instance, if a song of a songbird is directed towards a female or not towards a female. And this kind of interconnection between molecular biology and behavioral neuro neurobiology at this time, back in 1995 and 1998 respectively, was not at all common and has been really a pioneering step. And this kind of pioneering of techniques and technologies for then really unraveling new biology is kind of an, an, a fundamental uh, a thread that's going through throughout Eric's career. And he has been pioneering, for instance, uh, uh, also technologies for advanced for, uh, for the advancement of genome assemblies, as well as the establishment of transgenic birds, which for instance, allowed him to show that FOXP2 is not just an important player for the, uh, for the vocal learning in mammals, but also in birds. He has also been able to show that, for instance, there are convergent vocal learning systems across distantly related groups and has come up with an evolutionary theory how these this, uh, different uh, learning centers may have evolved in, within the different groups, basically through duplications of um, motor systems. Now, his uh, career basically has, uh, uh, he has, he has uh, uh, gotten lots of different prizes. I counted more than 20, and I don't want to just name them now all. Let me just say that since 2008, he has been an AJGM investigator, and uh, this has just been renewed again. Now, with this, I don't want to take up more of your time, and we are really looking forward to the talk on brain pathways for vocal learning and spoken language. So um, <clears throat> I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture uh, for the Cognitive Science Society. Uh, I know a lot of good colleagues that are part of the society and uh, folks that bridge the gaps between um, cognition and language, as well as between non-human animals and humans uh, for their abilities in um, cognition, but as well as uh, vocal communication that um, gives rise to at least the traits that contribute to language. So. <clears throat> I titled this talk, Brain Pathways for Vocal Learning and Spoken Language. And as you can see on this home slide here, we're gonna talk more about not just only humans, but uh, what have we learned from non-human animals about human spoken language. And I broke this talk down into uh, the first part into three different levels of analysis, behavioral, the anatomical, and the genetic. And then we're gonna test the hypothesis of what we learned here in mice. So at the behavioral level, um, 
uh, we're going to talk about vocal learning itself and language. And I encourage you to go look at um, articles that I and others wrote in the special issue of Science Magazine a few years ago on this topic for those who want to follow up with more information. And so <clears throat> many of us, um, as we um, experience uh, spoken language, uh, we don't realize that it consists of multiple traits that are brought together to have that experience. Uh, and some of these traits are ubiquitous amongst the animal kingdom, like auditory learning, uh, the ability to form new sound memories that you have. Uh, and some of them are rare and um, are unique to only a few group of species, like vocal production learning present in us and some species that can imitate us. And so all of these components together, like syntax, pragmatics, and so forth, come together to uh, basically contribute to this a specialized trait of spoken language. And using that framework, I define spoken language as a specialized form of learned vocal communication with some components found in most vertebrates and a highly specialized vocal learning component found in only a few species. And so what is that specialized component of what we call vocal production learning, the ability to produce new sounds? Uh, this has been only found in five groups of mammals that is humans, dolphins and whales or cetaceans, uh, bats, elephants, and seals, which belong to pinnipeds. Uh, and it's been found in three groups of birds, parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds. All of these species have close relatives that don't learn how to imitate, that is produced mostly innate sounds. So it's like uh, non-human primates to humans or falcons to parrots. So it's thought that each of these uh, mammalian bird groups evolved this trait independently of a common ancestor. Um, but uh, other components like auditory learning or comprehension, the ability to understand or novel information uh, using sound, uh, that's commonly found in like your pet animals and chickens uh, and so on. And an example I like to use is you can teach a dog to learn how to understand the human words sit in English or siente say in Spanish, osawati in Japanese, roll over, get the ball, so forth. Um, but a dog can't say, okay, you got it, I will sit. Uh, instead, a dog goes woof or barks. Um, and <clears throat> it can learn how to produce a woof for a particular context, like for food, for uh, petting, for attention, and so forth. And we call that vocal usage learning, where it learns to use innate or other species learn sounds in different contexts or for different meaning. Uh, but the actual acoustic structure of the sound is innate. Uh, but not all vocal learners are equal. As we know, humans are the most advanced, but amongst the non-human species, parrots are considered the most advanced. And here's an example of Disco, a male parakeet raised with humans for about four years and can produce up to about 400 words by the time uh, over that four year period. And here's an example. Never shake a baby bird. That would surely be absurd. Never shake a baby bird. That would surely be absurd. I am not a crook. My name is Tesco. So what's going on here? Well, you see uh, Disco is producing many human words uh, that he remembered and learned how to produce. Uh, and Disco is not only producing individual words, but recombining words into new sentences, so to speak. Uh, and sometimes they actually have a certain meaning, like uh, when he sees this uh, dog here and goes meow, kind of gets the uh, individual species wrong, but the actual category correct. And so, um, <clears throat> so this is what an, a good example of what we call vocal learning. Never. And um, <clears throat> uh, some people do get excited by findings in some of our closest relatives, uh, like uh, here in Coco the gorilla, um, where Coco was raised with humans for 39 years and uh, learned to actually do some sign language, but was also able to do some control of air going through the vocal tract. And here's an example. How about when you're um, 
coughing. That was good. You did a sneeze and then a cough. Excellent. Yeah, so here Coco is able to voluntarily control air exploration up the vocal tract, but Coco has difficulty, like many other species, modulating that airflow through the vocal tract, through the larynx, in the way that we humans do or through the syrinx, that the way these uh, vocal learning birds do. In contrast, Coco has very good auditory learning and auditory comprehension skills. Coco can understand um, many words in English, uh, a thousand or more, and actually can do also signing. And so, um, <clears throat> actually even several thousand. And so, uh, so auditory comprehension is much more advanced than the vocal production here. And that's caused us scientists, many of us that is, um, to ask the question, why can't we have our closest relatives to do something as simple as apple, whereas uh, those species that are much further away from us, like the parrots, uh, 300 million years separate from uh, mammals, can go even further and say all kinds of varieties of apples, like Golden Delicious, Macintosh, and so forth. And so this is the question that I've been asking myself over my career. And <clears throat> we've come up with a theory as to why, we call the mother theory of vocal learning at least what makes the major difference for vocal production learning. And, uh, but ours is not the only one around. And what I did in this uh, 2019 review is put forth what I consider the six most popular views on what makes the difference in species that have the ability to produce imitated vocalizations or spoken language and those that don't. And so the first hypothesis here is that uh, there's something different about brain size. Green is the forebrain here, red is the brainstem motor neurons for vocalizations, and blue uh, are the muscles that, or the oral facial musculature, the larynx and so forth that controls vocalizations. And so this idea that bigger brains uh, uh, enables the capacity to produce more complex behaviors, including learned vocalizations. Um, another hypothesis is, is that it's not a difference in brain size, but a difference in the actual vocal organs themselves. Uh, the further they send it down in the uh, larynx, for example, in some species, some have argued that um, that allows uh, some species to produce greater uh, variety of vocalizations than with the less descended larynx. Another is that <clears throat> is presence or absence of a particular forebrain circuit. Um, in this case, in the forebrain that projects down to the motor neurons for vocalizations that's absent in the non-vocal learners. A fourth is that uh, lots of species have these vocal uh, forebrain circuits, but uh, the difference is in whether you make a direct projection in the vocal learners in the black arrows here versus an indirect one, or maybe a direct projection that's weak that becomes more enhanced in the vocal learners. A fifth one here is that there is um, uh, a difference in the connection from the secondary auditory regions to Broca's area involved in speech production. And that uh, in non-human primates, it's either not there at all or there in a weak degree. And in humans uh, or vocal learners, it's much more robust. And finally, uh, one here, mostly coming from, the, I would say, the linguistics community, is that there's a separate language module in the brain uh, that uh, has all the algorithms that control for, um, the rules of grammar, syntax, and so forth, uh, that uh, impinges upon or basically instructs the auditory pathways and the vocal pathways on what to do. And reviewing all this evidence, I think it's strongest for three uh, combined hypotheses. That is a general difference in the brain. It's been shown, um, <clears throat> including from some, like from Tukums of Fitch and others, uh, uh, Herlakano, that uh, birds have a higher density of neurons in their telencephalon compared to mammals. And vocal learning birds even have a higher density, that is, more neurons per millimeter squared uh, compared to the non vocal learning species, which I think and they think will allow for a greater capacity. Uh, to actually evolve new brain pathways for vocal behavior. Uh, <clears throat> here, there are differences we see in the four brains of uh, species that have this vocal learning ability and those that don't, uh, in the presence or absence of particular brain circuits. And there also is a difference in uh, uh, the projections from the four brain to the uh, circuits that control vocalizations in the brainstem, being either direct or an enhanced direct projection compared to uh, species that don't imitate sounds where it's indirect. 
Uh, this descended uh, larynx uh, to Kumsitz Fitch work and others have shown that uh, this has been, I think, uh, proven uh, to be false. Uh, even there's some species, but independently descended larynx is compared to humans. Um, <clears throat> we found in mice that there is uh, direct projections, pretty robust direct projections from secondary auditory regions to motor regions, including a rudimentary uh, vocal motor region of the cortex. And I don't really see good evidence in humans or other vocal learning species of a, a separate module that controls syntax and sequencing or, um, or grammar in this case. Uh, so, and I don't think uh, I would consider Broca's also as that uh, substitute for a language module. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of my uh, talk is talk about some of the evidence for these uh, hypotheses. And one of those pieces of evidence comes from work uh, done when I was a postdoc, where we found when songbirds sing their learned songs, like the canary here. That act of producing learned song is associated with a rapid increase of what we call immediate early genes in the brain and white signal here. This is the mRNA product. Uh, this is the front of the brain here and the back of the brain, the cerebellum here. The red stain is staining all cells in the, in the brain and the white label is a measurement of the mRNA uh, that's upregulated in this case in the song learning nuclei, HPC here, Ariax, and LMAN. And we find uh, compared to silent control animals, the more a bird sings in a half hour period, the more upregulation you see of these uh, activity dependent genes that are responding to neural activity in the brain. A one fold increase for every song, learned song the bird sings in a half hour period. Uh, and we found that this is a motor-driven gene expression response. That is, it requires the bird uh, to sing or try to sing, uh, even in mute birds. And uh, it doesn't require auditory feedback. It doesn't require vision. It doesn't require some metasensory feedback, but it's a motor-driven response. And we use this as a molecular mapping tool, like an MRI tool, to identify communication circuits in uh, multiple different uh, vocal learning bird species, as well as non-learners. And we found that all species shown with these blue pathways here have an auditory pathway, whether they're a vocal learner or not. Uh, but we found that only the vocal learning species have uh, brains, four brain regions here that uh, lit up basically when they produce vocalizations where we did not find that in non-vocal learning species. And in yellow here, are the pathways discovered in songbirds that are responsible for producing the learned vocalizations through the brainstem motor neurons. Uh, and in red here is a cortical basal ganglia thalamic loop in, with the white arrow shown here that is responsible for acquisition of learning how to imitate the songs. And it instructs the motor pathway on what to do. And so <clears throat> this is consistent with all species having auditory learning, but only a limited few having the ability to produce uh, uh, sounds that they hear. And so what this indicates that we're either three independent gains of this trait shown in these uh, red dots here, according to this phylogenetic tree, uh, each time with a very similar brain pathway in all the vocal learning bird groups. Or maybe there was a common ancestor back here 65 million years ago and four independent losses, uh, and which would indicate a strong constraint to maintain this circuitry. Or maybe everybody has it to various degrees, uh, and it's been independently amplified in songbirds, hummingbirds, and parrots. And one thing I didn't appreciate at the time is maybe the tree is wrong, uh, and maybe these uh, species share similar circuitry because uh, they have a common ancestor with it. Uh, and that got me involved in sequencing the genomes of these species, uh, not only to get at the genes that could be involved in vocal learning, but to actually asked if we had the whole genome, not just a few genes or morphology and so forth, uh, could we get the true tree of uh, the avian uh, family tree for these orders? And uh, we did get a more resolved um, bird order family tree. And we found that it rearranged lots of rearrangements by looking at the entire genome. But the vocal learners shown here in the red dots are still separate. And in fact, the hummingbirds are pulled further apart uh, from Asian songbirds and parrots compared to this tree here. Uh, the songbirds and parrots come a little closer together, uh, which would indicate at least three independent origins, if not two, uh, followed by two losses. 
but to get a single origin back here at the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs, you would have to postulate that there were 10 independent losses uh, for parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds to have evolved this, to inherit the trait from a common ancestor. So <clears throat> with that solved, uh, we then began to look at and compare uh, these brain pathways with humans. And so here is a zebra finch brain on the left, and here is a zebra finch brain to scale with a human brain. You can fit roughly 3,000 of these zebra finch brains into a human. So the size is not making the big difference here. Neither is the cortical folding. Uh, I argue the difference is going to be inside the brain, that is the neural network connectivity. And to get at that, we had to overcome another obstacle. And that obstacle was for over 100 years, since the late 1800s, early 1900s, Lou and Edinger and the founders of uh, comparative anatomy had argued that the brain evolved in a linear fashion, like scale and natural, from the lowest forms to the highest forms. And they named brain structures of, of based upon this view, where they argue in the fish brain, you had this archistriatum, which is the amygdala, uh, which was then passed on to amphibians, who then uh, invented the paleostriatum, uh, which is part of the neostriatum in, in humans. Uh, I mean, the globus pallidus, sorry. And then uh, and they passed that on to reptiles, and reptiles invented the neostriatum, and so on, uh, until you get to bird who invented the hy hyperstratum. And so the bird brain was thought to be one large basal ganglia and very little cortical material, just the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb. And they considered all of the six layered cortex in mammals, in humans here to be more specific, to be new. That's why it was called the neocortex. Uh, I formed a consortium in the early 2000s that evaluated all this evidence to conclude that it's actually not true. Uh, birds and other vertebrates have a large cortical territory, just like mammals do, uh, compared to the other parts of the telencephalon, except that it's not layered. In birds, it's actually clustered in birds and reptiles. Uh, and here is the true basal ganglia, the striatum and the globus pallidus, uh, in purple and in uh, blue here. And it's not only involved in innate behavior, it's involved in learned behaviors as well. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, with this view in the early 2000s, um, uh, we still had some problems uh, with it, uh, even though we changed the, uh, what had been in practice for 100 years. And using comparative gene expression profiling, um, one argument was that these dorsal regions in blue in the bird brain are homologous to the six-layered cortex. So the hyperpalium is homologous to the six-layered cortex. And these regions below, the mesopalium, nidopalium, archipalium, are homologous to the claustrum and amygdala. Another view was that these uh, mesopalium, nidopalium, archipalium is homologous to the six-layered cortex, and there isn't really a homolog of the claustrum and amygdala. And using gene expression profiling of about 50 genes back in 2013, and more recently, the entire transcriptome made from the entire genome, uh, we looked at 20,000 genes within the bird brain, and we found that the organization is different than what we thought it was. Actually, these regions that we once considered as hyperpalium are really homologous cell types to regions below the ventricle here, divide here in the dashed line, uh, shown in red and green and orange here. It's like a mirror image practically, which we think corresponds to the different layers of the cortex as well as the claustrum and amygdala in terms of cell type homologies. Uh, recent work we just published in journal Comparative Neurology. And so uh, <clears throat> we're now calling this the primary pallium because we think this is like layer four neurons, secondary and tertiary pallium like layers two and three and so forth. Quaternary pallium like layer five neurons that send projections out of the brain. And with this, we, and we had to get this right because this is where the saw nuclei are located. And if you want to compare it to humans, you need to know the cell type homologies in which the cell types uh, that make up this uh, song system. And so putting all this together, came up with the following hypothesis, that we humans have not evolved, but actually have inherited a Wernicke's auditory cortex from a common ancestor with these birds. Uh, where these birds have auditory regions and different cell types that correspond to the different layers of Wernicke's uh, cort cortical regions. And that this is why dogs have the ability to understand human speech sounds. Uh, why Coco can understand when a person says, how about coughing? Uh, I don't think this is unique to humans. It may be expanded in humans, but not unique. Uh, but Wernicke's area in humans and the auditory regions in songbirds 
feed into a, a specialized circuit that we only find in the vocal learning species, uh, in humans as well. A motor pathway that includes laryngomotor cortex, two parts here, that sends direct projections out to the ambiguous motor neurons. And an anterior forebrain circuit that includes premotor laryngomotor cortex, Broca's area, anterior striatum, and the supplementary motor areas that is involved in all things complex about spoken language, including sequencing behavior and learning how to imitate sounds, and forms a cortical basal ganglionothalamic loop like we see here in these song learning birds that is either absent in non-human primates or rudimentary according to um, uh, some studies. And um, <clears throat> like in humans, uh, I mean, like in these birds, humans have a direct projection from these motor neurons uh, in the cortex that control vocalizations. So how could it have come about? We didn't really have an answer. How can you get a convergent circuit amongst these birds and the humans until we came across this finding where we found that when songbirds sing, uh, like I said earlier, there is this immediate early gene activation in their song learning nuclei. But we found that when they perform sequential movements, in this case, hopping in a rotating wheel, you also get motor driven gene expression in the brain region surrounding all the song nuclei in all vocal learning species that independently evolved this trait, songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds. And also in humans, uh, Stephen Brown had shown that when we learn how to do uh, novel dance moves, uh, the highest areas of activation in our brain are adjacent to the spoken language areas. And so we've seen in the non-vocal learning species, the, uh, they do have these movement-driven gene expression uh, areas, but without the song learning nuclei. And if you look at the connectivity of the song learning nuclei and connect, compare it to the connectivity of the surrounding uh, motor circuits, uh, it's very similar with some differences. Like you have a cortical basic language thalamic loop, you have a descending motor pathway, but it doesn't make direct projections. You have collaterals that go to the striatum like it does in mammals, but here in the vocal learning pathway, it doesn't uh, from these layer five-like neurons. And, and here is the study from Stephen Brown, as I mentioned earlier, that where we have um, movement-driven activation in the brain next to Broca's and laryngomotor cortex regions. So <clears throat> what's going on here? So to explain all of this, came up with this theory of what we call the motor theory of vocal learning origin, arguing that all species have this innate brainstem pathway for vocalizations. They have this anterior forebrain circuit in this motor pathway uh, to control learned movement for the wings, for the legs, for the body trunk, and so forth. And I argue during embryonic development that this motor learning circuit is replicated multiple times to connect different muscle groups to control movement, learned movements. But in the vocal learning species, humans, parrots, and songbirds, it's replicated one more time. And this new duplication of a whole brain pathway is now taking over the brainstem circuits that control vocalizations to get this emerging vocal learning pathway that's very similar to the surrounding circuits. Uh, and if this were true, we would expect these brain regions to have um, uh, similar functions to the surrounding motor pathways, including similar gene expression patterns. And this is what we went on to test uh, at the genetic level. Uh, are the song and spoken language pathway genes similar to motor circuits, but not to other brain regions? And are they specialized in certain ways as well? Uh, and so to, the way we went out to um, achieve this goal is to laser dissect out the song learning nuclei of each of the vocal learning species and the surrounding motor regions and profile them to microarrays at that time, uh, which is glass slides that contain sequences for many thousands of genes. And we did this also for vocal non-learning species that don't imitate sounds uh, and pretended they had song nuclei, dissected those regions in the surrounding areas. Uh, and uh, the Allen Institute was doing something similar for human brains, six people, several, 3,000 samples from around the cortex, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and so forth. Uh, and they also profiled gene expression uh, from non-human primates, including different cortical layers. And uh, folks in my lab at the time, who now have their own groups, uh, Andreas and Rina and Asiola, uh, analyzed all this data and generated the bird data to ask, can we find similar gene expression profiles that between the song areas and the speech areas? But we looked throughout the entire brain, uh, all 3,000 samples um, from these six patients. And what was found 
is that uh, the RA, I mean, sorry, the HVC sol nucleus, uh, with some recent data also from RNA seq data, had a gene expression profile that matched the human laryngeal motor cortex compared to everywhere else in the brain. And RA had a gene expression profile also that matched the laryngeal motor cortex, but for different layers. Uh, and I'll show you some of that data in a minute. Uh, and this is uh, what I mean by match. It means that there was a set of genes that were up or down regulated compared to the surrounding motor pathways in both humans and in songbirds in these specific brain regions that we did not see in chickens or quails or pigeons or in non-human primates like macaques or marmosats. Uh, and marmosats have an area 6V that shows neural activity with vocalizations, but we didn't see any specializations there. Uh, in contrast, we did see specializations in humans. And a part of the anterior striatum in humans match uh, in terms of specialized gene expression profiles, area X of songbirds. And so, so what is going on here with HPC and RA? Recent work from uh, Greg Jedman in my lab, I looked at this further because at first when we did this, we did not see a convergence with HPC, but now we see it when we compare it to the surrounding motor pallium. Uh, most of the genes are actually interesting here. We have a small set of genes that show up and down regulation, roughly 100. Uh, in uh, HVC and RA together, but for the most part, uh, either they show up regulation in HVC or RA or down regulation in HVC and RA, but not both. And uh, work from Michael Brainard's lab had profiled single neurons, gene expression profiles in HVC and RA, and we compared their expression profiles with those cell types. And what we found is that the RA neurons that showed specialized gene expression convergence with human laryngeal motor cortex matched layer five neurons first, as I said, but it was the projecting neurons of RA, of the songbird RA that project out of the brain in synapse onto the motor neurons that control vocalizations, consistent with its matched layer five neurons. Whereas the gene expression specializations in HPC were the neuron types that from HPC project to RA as opposed to the project to the striatum, uh, which we would then hypothesize would be the layers two, three neurons of the laryngeal motor cortex that project to the layer five neurons. And so um, <clears throat> uh, what are some of those genes? One of them, one of our favorites, it's called SLIT1. It's an axon guidance molecule when mutated in humans causes a speech disorder, speech sound disorder, or autistic deficits in verbal expression. Uh, we find that it's turned off, it's down-regulated in the layer five neuron equivalent in these birds of the vocal learning species, but not the non-vocal learning species. And in humans and in parrots, actually we found two areas of specialized regulation, down-regulation, uh, that correspond to what we called at the time, and uh, Eddie Chang also later, ventral laryngeal motor cortex and dorsal laryngeal motor cortex. And they correspond exactly to the work from Eddie Chang's group when uh, they're recording neural activity in patients where they're removing tumors or epileptic regions that show the highest activation of speaking in humans, uh, the exact coordinates where we see the specialized gene expression. And what's interesting about this area is, or, or RA, so like, is what is RA controlling in the vocalizations? It is controlling the acoustic structure of the sounds, but particularly uh, neural firing patterns in RA correlated with the so the, the sound spectrogram here, time on the x-axis and frequency of the sound on the y-axis, correlates well with the pitch. Uh, the higher the firing rate of the RA pro uh, projection neurons, the higher the uh, spiking activity, that is, the higher the pitch. And Eddie Chang's group had recently asked this question in humans, uh, which area of the, let's call it the language cortical regions that includes dorsal laryngeal motor cortex, ventral laryngeal motor cortex, uh, the temporal gyrus here for the auditory cortical region, including Broca's. Which of these brain regions shows activity that correlates most with pitch when patients are being asked to speak and emphasize a higher pitch on different parts of the same sentence? Like, I never said she stole my money, or I never said she stole my money. Uh, and what they found is that <clears throat> The dorsal laryngeal motor cortex uh, shows the strongest correlation with increased pitch production uh, compared to the ventral laryngeal motor cortex and actually a negative correlation in the auditory cortex. And dorsal laryngeal motor cortex is the most correlated with um, RA gene expression in songbirds. 
So here we have a functional parallel that correlates with a molecular and a physiological parallel as well. Uh, by the way, like in songbirds, some of these saw nuclei in some species show hearing-induced neural activity uh, when they hear song. The same thing for the dorsal laryngeal motor cortex. It shows hearing-induced neural firing as well to the same uh, speech sounds that, are, that it was uh, involved in the production, except the hearing activity is uh, post, uh, you know, in other words, shows up later on in the brain than the production activity. That is, you get premotor neural firing for speech production here. So <clears throat> now we ask the question, what is causing these gene expression specializations in songbirds and humans? Uh, and to ask this question, uh, what we did in looking at the neural D6 gene, for example, uh, which is downregulated in the RA saw nucleus and in the laryngeal motor cortex here in the central sulcus of the human speech motor cortex. Um, <clears throat> what uh, Lindsay Caton did in my lab is to dissect out the song learning nuclei in the surrounding brain regions and profile what we call epigenetic signals, ataxic signals, to see which areas of the genome have open regulatory regions uh, in front of these genes like neural D6. And sure enough, we found inside the RA cell nucleus compared to the surround uh, regions of the genome that had high activity uh, only in RA, but not the surround uh, in front of neuro D6 and uh, highlighted in these colors here. And one of those regions here, I, highlighted by the blue bar here, James Cahill, my lab shown, had accelerated evolution of novel nucleotide changes that we saw in no other bird species except for vocal learners, uh, shown here in these red uh, nucleotide changes, like from a T to a C. So all non-vocal learning species had this highly conserved sequence here in black, and the vocal learners had independent mutations. And guess what? These mutations here converted this a sequence from what we don't, we wonder what it does, we don't know, but converted this sequence from a, not a binding site for the androgen receptor to a binding site for the uh, androgen receptor. And guess what? We also found, um, this prompted us to go look back at the Allen Institute microarray data and we found that actually the androgen receptor is at higher expression levels in both men and women in laryngeal motor cortex cortical regions uh, compared to the surrounding motor cortex. Uh, another convergence with these song learning birds. And so uh, the hypo working hypothesis we have here is that vocal learning birds evolved the mutation in a regulatory region in front of this neuro D6 transcription factor expressed in these layer five neurons of, um, <clears throat> of humans and songbirds. And that allowed, uh, that converted it into an angioreceptor binding site, which when bound, we think suppresses neuro D6 expression. Neuro D6, we know binds to slit one and regulates slit one. And we think that then suppresses slit one regulation in the laryngeal motor cortex on the RA saw nucleus. But how do, you, what, how do you suppress the expression in laryngeal motor cortex, but not the surrounding motor pathway? We think that there's another mechanism that acetylates with histones um, <clears throat> the, this brain region, I mean, this genomic region in front of the neuro D6 gene, and then preventing the repressor from binding, from the receptor from binding, allowing higher levels of slit one expression. Uh, so that's a model we're testing as to why you get the specialized expression. Now we'd like to ask, well, after you have this specialized gene expression, what happens? You know, why uh, change this regulation of these genes in the first place in these speech areas? And so <clears throat> uh, one hypothesis we're working under is that when slit binds to its receptor robo one it repels axon connections from forming. And so in non-vocal learning species, in green here, slit one is high. And when it goes down the axons, and, uh, uh, and the axons are migrating away from the layer five neurons to the brainstem area here. Uh, the motor neurons we know, nucleus ambiguous, has very high levels of the receptor. And so we think that repels the axons from making a direct projection from the cortex to the motor neurons that control vocalizations, it's, and which would not allow for fine motor control. However, in the vocal, in the vocal learning species, which have downregulated slit one, uh, we think <clears throat> that will allow the direct uh, axons from layer five to form a direct projection uh, and onto the motor neurons, regardless of whether or not they have the roboreceptor, allowing fine motor control of the cortex 
uh, for vocalizations. And so this is what we're working on now, testing this hypothesis. Can we upregulate slip one in the songbird or downregulate it in a non-vocal learning bird species uh, and even take over an existing pathway to see if we can make an indirect connection direct? That's hard to do with birds because the genetic tools aren't there, uh, but they are there for mice. And so we actually started this work on mice to ask the question, uh, can we actually regulate connection to become direct in mice for vocal behavior and what will happen? Uh, and so that's the uh, last part of our presentation here. We're gonna talk about testing mice. And before we even test the function of these genes in mice, we needed to learn something about their vocal communication circuits. And uh, findings back in 2005 from Tim Holly's group led us to conclude that our thinking about mice might have to change. Uh, here is uh, ultrasonic vocalizations of a male mouse uh, who, who's vocalizing to a female pitched down to our hearing range. It sounds like a songbird. And here is a male producing those vocalizations, trying to court a female. And if uh, <clears throat> the vocalizations are more you know, complex and so forth, she likes it, well, we'll see that in a minute. And <clears throat> Uh, what they found is that uh, even different brothers of the same litter, a mouse one, two, and three here, will have different syllable types at different compositions, so repertoire composition differences, indicating that it may not be totally innate. So that pro prompted my lab and several other labs to study these mouse vocalizations and ask, uh, we've been assuming for decades that they're innate. Are they really innate? And the answer is yes, mostly innate. Uh, there are several groups that have argued they're completely innate, no plasticity at all, and some, including my group uh, from postdocs and graduate students in my lab at the time, uh, just show that there's some level of vocal plasticity, but not what we see in the songbirds or parrots or hummingbirds and certainly not in humans. And so uh, what about the brain pathways themselves? Well, we found that when these mice produce these ultrasonic songs, Unexpectedly, we found the region of the primary motor cortex and secondary motor cortex that lit, lit up with these immediate early genes, like we see in songbirds, and a part of the striatum as well. And when we place neural tracers in the laryngeal muscles, transsynaptic tracers uh, that jump synapses, they went back up to this, from nucleus ambiguous, to uh, this region where we found this immediate early gene activation for, with vocal, vocalizing. And these were the layer five neurons, which would you expect? from a projection to nucleus ambiguous. And when you inject tracers into uh, this motor cortex region here, uh, filling up these layer five neurons, we found that they had axons going down to the motor neurons for nucleus ambiguous. Very few of them though, like one to two to three axons per motor neuron. You can see the uh, black squiggly lines here contacting the motor neurons here. Unlike songbirds, which have hundreds to thousands of axons per motor neuron synapsing onto the uh, motor neurons that control vocalizations, or the limited data we have from humans uh, in uh, neurodegenerating studies, here are the uh, ambiguous motor neurons, and you can see more than one or two axons uh, per motor neuron here in the human brainstem. And so we think this is a difference of degree than absolute presence or absence of a direct projection from the cortex in humans versus mice. Uh, and <clears throat> This goes along with uh, Roger Lemon's uh, hypothesis that uh, the more manual dexterity you get in your hands, going from rodents to monkeys, old world monkeys to humans, uh, the more axons you have coming down from the forebrain, either with um, indirect projections uh, to the motor neurons that control the limbs, or um, higher number of axons in direct projections, finally, as when you get to humans, to control fine man manual dexterity. Maybe the same thing is going on for vocal behavior as well. Uh, <clears throat> and so we set out to ask that question, for example, what about humans and non-human primates? Here in the dorsal laryngeal motor cortex, uh, you know, in Christina Simonian's review here, humans have both this direct projection and this indirect projection to, to the laryngeal muscles, whereas non-human primates have only this direct pro indirect projection. What about do they actually have it, but this never been found? Uh, for the uh, direct projection, sorry, in non-human primates. And I believe uh, this is the case. And Peter Strick's work, in the, in recent work, unpublished from this group, is indicating it might be the case. 
Um, so, <clears throat> but let's study mice further. Christina told me that, uh, Christina Simonian, that is, that she does not believe, would not believe that the area that we find in mice uh, that makes this sparse direct projection is functional uh, for vocal behavior unless we stimulate and we get laryngeal muscle activity. And so a recent graduate student in my lab, Cesar Vargas, is, did just this, and he stimulated in all areas of the frontal cortex of mice. And we found that the very region we found vocalizing driven gene expression and also making that direct projection actually caused uh, laryngeal muscle EMG activity to occur with a 10 millisecond delay, which we think is mostly through an indirect projection, but it still actually had some functional response in the larynx, but also in the jaw muscle. So it wasn't just the larynx alone. And he also found the more interior area that some others had uh, called the oral motor cortex because it was this area that had been shown in literature causes jaw muscle contractions in mammals. And that's what uh, Cesar found as well. But we also found it caused the weak induction of neural, of, um, sorry, uh, uh, muscle con uh, contractions in the uh, mouse larynx as well. But even with a shorter delay at five milliseconds, indicating a direct projection there. And we're trying to figure out now, does this actually make a direct projection? It's, an, it's a paradox for us. But nevertheless, this region of the brain controls, or at least has some type of control over laryngeal muscles plus other muscle groups in the face area. And so uh, what about the gene expression specializations? Uh, here is that downregulation of SLIT1 in the Songbird RA. We do not see it downregulated in the mouse motor cortex nor specialization of other genes. So this led to um, what we call the continuum hypothesis, where we argue it's not a all or none. It's not a binary trait. That is, we have some species like lizards that don't vocalize at all, so they can't even have vocal learning. Uh, you have others like chicken and mice that have rudimentary or limited vocal plasticity, which we call limited to moderate vocal learners. And uh, then you have the complex vocal learners like the bats and the songbirds, uh, our classical uh, vocal learning species. And then you have the high vocal learners like humans and parrots, who actually have two vocal communication circuits in parallel. And as you go up this stepwise type of continuum, uh, the fewer species that have this trait. So uh, what about manipulation of these circuits in mice? It would mean instead of trying to actually induce a connection, maybe we can enhance an already existing connection by down-regulating slit one, and seeing if we can actually cause a sparse projection to become more robust. And while we were proposing this hypothesis and thinking about this and trying to gear up the experiments and doing it, actually trying to do it, a work from uh, Yutaka's lab uh, found, did something similar for the limb motor neurons, where they found that the plexin A1 gene, like slit one, is downregulated in layer five neurons of humans, but not mice. And they surmise, like SLIP1, it's a repulsive molecule, prevents connections from forming. But it's not just speech motor cortex that's downregulated, it's the entire motor cortex of humans. And so <clears throat> using viral vectors, they were able to downregulate plexin A1 a receptor in the layer 5 neurons of the mouse uh, uh, cortex and found that when they did that, that caused, you see the red axons here, increased neuronal density on the motor neurons that control the limbs in mice. And, they, and it's shown quantitatively here. And these mites were able to actually have greater manual dexterity of their fingers in eat spaghetti faster. Uh, <clears throat> we, found, uh, we didn't find any change in vocal behavior with the plexin mice, but we did with uh, slit one mice with a knockout in the motor cortex. Uh, and <clears throat> what we find is that these mice, uh, even in pups, uh, uh, and their isolation calls produce a higher proportion of calls that have higher bandwidth to them and more pitch jumps, as they're called. And we're now doing experiments to test whether or not they have more flexibility to modify their vocalizations. Um, <clears throat> and so what's interesting about some of these genes, like SLIP1, it's not only regulated by neural D6, it's also regulated by FOXP2. And many of you know that FOXP2 is a, is a transcription factor when mutated, causes a speech deficit in human, and here's an example. Your name? Asking your name? 
Laura? Where do you live, Laura? She's trying to say Sheffield. And how old are you? Four. She's trying to say four years old. Your name? Laura is a four-year-old child, um, has difficulty producing learned speech, as you can tell. Her siblings without this heterozygous mutation or this transcription factor can produce speech just fine. But Laura has good speech comprehension, good auditory learning. So this is a gene that's, uh, that's specifically, or let's say in a, it's, it's uh, more enriched in enhanced in speech function uh, than other functions. And uh, uh, Simon Fisher, who we collaborated with, created a transgenic animal with the same mutation that Laura has. And we analyzed the vocal behavior of this animal. And we found that in wild type males, when uh, they smell female urine, it's a sexually inducing stimulus, they start to produce their courtship songs uh, with very simple syllable types. But when they're in the presence of a live female, they more often switch to these more complex syllable types that I was telling you about earlier that the slit one mice had difficulty producing. Well, guess what? The Fox V2 mice also have difficulty producing these more complex syllable types here. Uh, they can't, they have difficulty, like Laura switching to more complex uh, phonemes, here these mice have difficulty switching to more complex syllables. So even before spoken language evolved, we think uh, FOXP2 is being utilized for more complex sequencing of vocal behavior, even in mice. Uh, and here's what I said, when you give females in a Y maze the choice of listening to the more complex, sexier songs versus the more simple ones, she spends more time next to the speakers producing the more complex syllable types. What about those layer five neurons that project down to nucleus ambiguous? They exist in these mice with the FOXP2 mutation. However, instead of being primarily localized in the motor cortex here, they're more spread out in the frontal lobe or in the frontal cortex of these mice. And so we think FOXP2 is also controlling the localization, the migration of these neurons into the motor cortex that then synapse onto the uh, nucleus ambiguous and surrounding reticular formation. And so to jump back out here and take this uh, bigger umbrella view, we've learned a lot from non-human species whether they be vocal learners or non-vocal learners, including the songbirds and the parrots or the mice and the non-human primates. And we now can say, we know a lot more about these vocal learning circuits showing this network diagram for songbirds, the production pathway here, HBC and RA, onto the brainstem motor circuit, and the learning pathway, the acquisition pathway, uh, forming this loop. We learned a lot about it and we now have based upon our gene expression profile and connectivity diagrams or connectivity uh, uh, results, we can propose the specific cell types in the human speech pathways that correspond to this circuit here in the songbirds and test hypothesis. Will the layer five neurons of human laryngeal motor cortex fire in a sequential fashion every 10 milliseconds to control every 10 milliseconds of a particular phone? And does the layer five neurons uh, um, sorry, layer three and two and three neurons function in that way, and then uh, control the layer five neuron to control the pitch uh, that Eddie Chang's group was measuring in his stimulation studies. Uh, will uh, Broca's area and, and the premotor cortex function similarly as the l man song nucleus and the mesopalium song nuclei to uh, uh, interact with the basal ganglia and control what the laryngeal motor cortex does? And so all of these can now can, are testable hypotheses uh, as much as we can do with humans. And taking even a bigger step back, uh, here uh, in this vertebrate family tree, all of them have a cortical territory uh, highlighted in green here. And the cortex is just divergent in its organization across all these species. The basal ganglia here in white is more conserved, all right? And so, uh, uh, but, if a, a layered cortex in humans and a, a nuclear cortex in birds can evolve a similar cell type with similar connectivity that controls uh, learned vocalizations independently in birds and mammals, who's to say that a crocodile or some other species won't evolve or another mammal won't evolve vocal learning in the next half a million years or so? And I can predict what, if and when it does, it will have similar convergent uh, gene expression changes and connectivity. And eventually, I think that'll help us understand by using this comparative approach and evolutionary perspective, 
why our closest relatives can't do this. And maybe one day we can genetically manipulate them to do that or repair brain, our own brain circuits when um, speech uh, has some disorders to it. So uh, take home messages here. Complex behaviors can evolve multiple times uh, from deeply homologous but diverse brain circuits, cells, and genes. And a trait like spoken language can be understood from studies in distant related animals. And convergent evolution of, of mechanisms for a trait is associated with similarities and disorders of that trait, like we see in the FOXV2 or SLIP1. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the people who uh, did a lot of this work that you saw that I credited in the slides. Uh, my group here um, at Rockefeller University and many of the collaborators that I've collaborated with, as well as the uh, uh, funding sources that contributed to this effort uh, from NIH, uh, including most recently an NIH Director's Transformative Research Award that is uh, supporting the mouse studies uh, from Howard Hughes uh, for a lot of my work and from the Keck Foundation also for the mouse studies and uh, the Packard Foundation for the birds and so forth. Uh, so I'm ready to take questions and thank you for your attention. Okay, so many thanks for this highly stimulating and interesting talk. Um, I would invite the audience to please uh, put questions in the chat. In the meantime, I have a, a, a question to you concerning actually the evolutionary convergent versus non-convergent um, uh, 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 um, uh, evolution of this trade. Mm -hmm. Uh, you basically base the conclusion that it is convergent evolution on the fact that you have more losses than gains. But one may argue that a loss is much more easy to get. Basically, for each loss, you just have to mutate a single gene in extreme case and you just lose it than to gain this. Um, so which requires multiple mutations. So mm -hmm. do you really think that this is so do you think this may you may have to revisit this conclusion um, if you'll find also more molecular similarities? Yeah, uh, can you hear me and just double check? Yes, yes, Great. I can. All right. So according to our latest bird family tree, just amongst the birds alone, right? That um, if if this trait was lost uh, and then three groups of species th species maintained it, the songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds. You have to go back to the time of extinction of dinosaurs about 66 million years ago to have a common ancestor that had vocal learning that then a whole bunch of other lineages lost it. And it would be a minimum of 10 li bird lineages like penguins, falcons, um, pigeons, and so forth that lost it. So I, I think the, the rules of parsimony are there. We, we have some uh, other study we're working on theoretic, you know, statistical analysis, like mm -hmm. what is the probability that this could have been gained three times or two times, right? Uh, versus lost 10 or more times. And, and the probability is of, of the multiple losses is really, you know, uh, uh, very low, um, meaning that it's unlikely. So, so that's what- what, what is, Okay, what is the probability based on? I mean, because you, you have certain assumptions behind this probability, right? Yeah, we, we looked at mutation rates of, of, of genomes over a million, millions of years and so forth. So we, we use mutation rates to try to calculate, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's the likelihood to co converge in a similar sequence multiple times in multiple sequences. But, but that, 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 that leads me to the second part of the answer. And that is, um, uh, I don't think, you know, we, we now have several hundred genes that are convergent between human and songbird speech areas and song areas, right? And I don't think those several hundred genes that each one of them independently evolved the same genetic changes uh, suffer from each other. Uh, I think a set of transcription factors, like 10 or 20 transcription factors, convergently change and then regulated hundreds of other genes uh, to up or down regulate them. So you need to change a few genes to cause a, the uh, functional differences in expression for many of them. And then when it comes to humans, it's really hard to argue loss in uh, many mammalian orders, uh, but retaining in humans and birds and loss in lots of reptiles in between mm. birds and humans uh, to, to, to have it 
be a homologous trait, you have to go back 300 million years for birds and the ancestor of humans to have homologous trait of vocal learning, and then it's lost in all these other mammals and reptiles. Okay. I see. Okay. There is, in the meantime, there are several questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I maybe quickly read this out. So question from Courtney Hilton. Fantastic talk. Do you think that any of these neural specializations for vocal learning could also have implications for non-vocal production aspects of cognition? E.g., cortical basal ganglia, thalamocortical thalam loops, etc. also seem important for some aspects of musical and linguistic syntax in humans. Yeah, I, I think there is a relationship. Um, so I did, I did make that distinction between auditory learning or comprehension and uh, vocal production learning, saying that you know, most vertebrate species have auditory learning. But even there, I think the vocal learners are more advanced in that skill. As we heard earlier in one of the other talks about non-human primates not having as good auditory learning as humans. So, so what are some of the enhanced abilities in the vocal learners that you don't find that's outside the vocal domain? Well, one of them as part of this conference is like, you know, rhythm uh, production and beat perception and so forth. So, you know, if you subscribe to the hypothesis that only vocal learners can learn how to synchronize their body to rhythmic beats of music, uh, that would be uh, um, uh, an, an enhancement. And one way that could come about is that the larynx in, in, in humans or mammals, the syrinx in birds, is the most rapidly firing muscles in the body, except for the lateral rectus of the eyes. And you need to integrate auditory input to control these rapidly firing muscles. And maybe that mechanism that allowed this auditory motor integration for speech contaminated the rest of the motor cortex or the motor circuit uh, broadly allowing greater synchronization to sound for the rest of the body, not just the larynx. That, that would be one example. Okay, then the next question is from Tecumseh Fitch. Thanks for a great talk, Erich. I was wondering if you can combine the continuum hypothesis with what we know about timing in these repellent genes like slit and robo. You know Matsunaga and Okano Akanoya's work on Katirin expression in RA that is that it changes right when the vocal production stage begins. Could it all be a matter of timing differences in gene expression? Yes, yeah, so, some have argued that, uh, and Tukunsa knows about this as well, some have argued, I think Terrence Deacon and others, that these direct projections uh, from the cortex down to the motor neurons may already be robust or at least at a higher density in young animals and then they get pruned away and maybe less pruned away in humans and it depends on timing when that pruning occurs. Uh, we don't really know, actually in the limb motor neurons there is some truth to that in mice, um, but we don't see this in nucleus ambiguous, at least so far what we've looked at. The, the density is the same in the young animals as is in the old animals. Uh, and so meaning that the timing of the changes uh, we don't see correlating with the timing of changes necessarily in the vocalizations of these animals developmentally. Other than that, I don't know the answer. I think it just needs to be one of these things that need to be tested. Okay. So... We only had two, two questions of interest here. I, I, I will add for, for um, just to prime people for some studies that um, uh, we're going to submit soon uh, to this first question on enhanced abilities. We have even am, even amongst vocal learning species, there are differences. So what, if we just study humans, all we know is what humans do, uh, and humans are the only vocal learning primate or advanced vocal learning primate. But if you look at songbirds, there are about 4,000 songbird species, and some are very complex vocal learners can imitate hundreds of songs, sounds out there in the environment, chainsaws, car horns, and so forth. And some, like the zebra finch, sing one simple song. Um, and what we found uh, recently is that the species that have greater song repertoires and greater open-ended vocal learning abilities uh, have better cognitive problem-solving skills like you know, for figuring out how to get food from under a cup using a paper clip, using tools and so forth. And so, so I do think there is gonna be a correlation 
uh, with uh, vocal learning ability, even with among the vocal learners and uh, cognitive like behaviors outside of the vocal realm. I think one type of circuit is influencing the others. Okay, interesting. Um, there are more questions now in the mm -hmm. chat. Um, question from F Felix Heiduk. Thanks for the good talk. I have a question that is not directly related to your talk, though. We've heard, we, we heard a talk by Robert Zatora before about the relation of auditory cortical predictions and the reward system in the striatum for music. Do you know whether there are any neural systems of auditory prediction in birds as well? And if so, are they related to their reward system? And would you predict, uh, predict them to be more advanced the higher up you are on the vocal learning continuum? That is, would you predict parrots to gain pleasure from predictive slash surprising vocalizations, but not chickens? Yeah, um, so we don't have the exact answer there for, uh, you know, uh, the auditory predictability and dopamine release in the striatum, but we do know, it's uh, some of the earlier work in my lab and others, is that when those songbirds sing, their learned songs, there is dopamine release into the striatal vocal learning region uh, it, during the act of singing. And it's different when they're singing courtship song as to when they're singing their undirected, or what we call undirected, like shower-like practicing song, like you're singing in the shower. And so there is dopamine release in both cases, and it's different in both cases. I believe it was higher when they were singing their courtship song to the females. Uh, and so whether that's rewarding um, for you know, imitation, rewarding for courtship and so forth, we don't know. It's really hard to ask the birds, but certainly um, it would be consistent with that hypothesis that you know, uh, Robert talked about. Okay. Then another question by uh, Sonia Vernes. Thanks for a really engaging talk, as always, Ari. Regarding the motor duplication theory you talked about, you tested this through genetic and molecular methods. You mentioned that you expect this duplication to occur during development. As such, is this something you can or you can or plan to explore at the neurobiological histological level in learning slash non-learning birds during early development? Uh, very good question, Sonia, and, and hello. Um, and so uh, the answer is yes. And so, you know, I, we came up with this motor theory of vocal learning origin hypothesis around 2008 or so, and, and really haven't experimentally tested the specific mechanism I proposed that Sonia is bringing up, that the during development, I'm arguing in the vertebrate brain, these cortical basic endothalamic learning loops are replicated multiple times to control different muscle groups of the body. And we don't know if that's really the case and whether the vocal learning system evolved or even is developing out of a motor circuit. And so I just proposed in my Howard Hughes renewal, I got renewed last week for my Howard Hughes position, so I'm happy this week. Um, and that's exactly one of the experiments we propose. And what we're gonna try to do is the mitochondrial genome uh, in, in uh, all animals, right? Including in the brain, it mutates as the neurons divide from one generation to the next. Uh, not, I mean, it doesn't mute every cell division, but every 20, 40, 100 cell divisions, you can get a mutation. And you can sequence the mitochondrial genome of neurons in the brain, let's say in the speech areas and the non-speech areas, and ask, is Broca's related to, uh, uh, or laryngeal motor cortex related to a, a foot area or some other part of the motor cortex, or is it related to Broca's and so forth? You can track the evolutionary history or the developmental history, I should say, of these uh, neurons using mitochondrial sequences. And that's the experiment we're gonna try, Sonia. And, and so stay tuned. And I think that will help be the first step to test this hypothesis, even in human brains. Okay. I see there's one here about the learning continuum. No, this is a continuation of the oh, okay. question above. This was about the, uh, the pleasure in chicken versus parrots. Right. <laughs> so. Okay, so I think, yeah. Okay, we are, we are anyway over time as I'm, <laughs> as I'm getting reminded here. So um, many thanks again for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation and also for all the questions and for answering all the questions. Um, and yeah, many thanks. You're welcome, my pleasure. <laughs>